I just promoted him to the panelist. Yes, he came. Um, yeah. Very good morning, Professor Salim Ahmed. Are you able to hear? Uh, Professor Rebashi, he has to unmute. He has to uh, unmute. Professor Ahmed, you have to I've unmute done yourself. I've done it. I've done it. Uh, um, I've Professor Brinan has already joined us. He okay. is uh, ready to start. If you could okay. introduce him, please. Okay, I'd like to share the screen. Yeah, please. Um, um, Professor Brinan, can we uh, uh, stop your screen sharing now? Okay. All right. Let me stop it. All right. Yes. Professor Salim, you can uh, put it on. Okay. Are you able to see me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Good morning to all of you. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Anthony Brennan. Uh, Dr. Brennan received his PhD in material engineering from Virginia Tech. He has worked in course medic biomedical company and is a former medic member of NIH study section, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. He's currently the chair of the board of directors in Chocolate Technologies. His research interests include biointerfaces, anti-fouling, polymer surfaces modification, polymer networks, micro topographies, and tissue engineering. He has published several research papers on material science, bioaddition, anti-fouling and surface modification as well. It's my great pleasure to have you here uh, to present a paper uh, on the topic, chocolate bio-inspired surfaces, design mechanisms and efficacy. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. It, um, I wish to thank everybody for organizing this conference and inviting me so that I'm able to uh, talk with everyone. I certainly hope it's a very successful conference for everyone. With that, I will start. <clears throat> Somebody might need to mute, their dog is barking in the background. So again, thank you and um, what I'd like to start with is an outline of uh, what I plan to give you today, just biofouling, give you some examples of it, show you some natural topographies, uh, go over the Sharkla bio-inspired topographies, discuss the anti-fouling performance that we have measured with it, and how we've gone about the modeling of the behavior to better understand it. We've also got some uh, clinical results as well as uh, everyday user results that I believe will be uh, significant at this time. I'll finish off with a summary and my acknowledgments. So first of all, I draw your attention to the figure in the upper right where the Indian River, which is close to here about a, two hours away, and the manatees spend a lot of time, or the sea cow as we call them, and they're covered with algae. So that um, challenges their health. We see down below here on the right, the barnacles on a gray whale, and we can see the barnacles are quite extensive on this whale. And on this lower left, I always enjoy this image because it's, it's the um, barnacles and they've literally fouled oyster shells. So we can see that they're pernicious 
and um, pervasive in everything they go on to. The sea turtle up here, both the sea turtle and manatees are very common guests of Florida, is also covered with some sponge, bryozoans, and barnacles on its body. So we see barnacles is not just something, biofouling is not just something that bothers navies in the um, shipping industry, but it bother, bothers many of the animals also. So in terms of active antifouling strategies that have been looked at, the termite wing is one of the more interesting ones as shown here. The droplets of water on the termite wing, you can see, any of you familiar with it, has an extremely high contact angle. So it's in the Cassie-Baxter super hydrophobic regime. And this is accomplished by hierarchical structures that go from the uh, micron level down to the submicron level. The pitcher plant is shown here, and the pitcher plant has gotten a little more uh, publicity lately with one uh, study group that's been looking at slips technology in which they're just infusing polymers into the fibrous structure. And these polymers have a combination of hydrophobic, hydrophobic behaviors, and so they give it high contact angles similar to what the natural plant does. The rose petals has always been another very interesting one for me. This is the underside of the rose petal and thus you have a captive air bubble here. But the rosebud petal has a hierarchical structure where these are on the order of a couple microns across and you can see the topography of nanostructure on top of that. Uh, the cicada wing is another interesting one. You can see the different sections of the cicada wing. I draw everybody's attention to the fact that it's completely transparent here. And so that pushes you into the understanding that these features, these um, protrusions on the wing are in the submicron regime, thus in, um, minimizing any scattering of light and giving them the transparency. The muscle shell is shown here. And this is the blue muscle and the red muscle. And the blue muscle has well-defined um, channels on it, and this doesn't follow, but the red muscle does. And the blue muscle is the more common one that people eat. Crab shells are similar to the flowers, the lotus leaf, and the rose petals I just showed you in terms of their protrusions. The dolphin skin is another one that's been looked at, and people have tried to um, replicate it. Uh, it's a very complex structure, and it's confounded by the fact that it's pumping oil through it at all times. So there's a positive pressure um, which helps keep it clean. And then, of course, the shark skin, which is what our interest is. And with that, I'll, I'll lead us into the next slide. And we talk about the sharklet texture, and this is a Galapagos shark. And if you look at the nose of the shark, the orientation of the shark scales or denticles or placoids, and some people can call them scales, but they are dentical structures or tooth-like structures. This is the nose of the shark at the top of the slide and the tails at the bottom. You can see they're all oriented in the same direction and they're stacked. And if you do a cross section, if we cut right through here and look at a cross section, we see the stacking order. And that's a very important thing in terms of hydrodynamics. But it's also important and my interest was in the geometry of these parts and the fact that you have an odd number of these riblets on each of the features. And that's consistent with all shark species. They go anywhere from three to nine ridges. But they're always identified by having a central feature and then two adjacent that are similar to each other, the next two are similar to them, and the last ones and so forth. But this central one is, this, is the leading edge of the, everything. So when we tried to draw it, we ended up drawing it like this. And instead of stacking, we flattened the whole features. And when we did that, we ended up sharing on these diamond structures and ended up showing, sharing this small feature, which is a critical part. And if you look at it as a cross section, you can see I've got basically channels all the way through. Um, all very important aspects of it. So let's look at the biofouling assays that we did early on that led us to the shark. The first thing was I was looking at a submarine in Pearl Harbor and I saw it going out with algae like this on it. And it's a great covering of the, shark, of the submarine, which is a bad thing. The green algae puts off plants, put off spores, billions of these spores, and they're on the order of five micron diameter, about seven microns long. And you can see the flagella, which allows them to swim. When they attach to a surface, they spin out an adhesive pad, 
and that pad size is proportional to the hydrophobicity or surface energy of the slide. As hydrophilic surfaces get a bigger pad, hydrophobic get a smaller pad. The bond is strongest to the hydrophobic surface. But once the pad is spun out, these start to aggregate as shown here, and that becomes the blades of the grass as you see here. And so the whole cycle continues. And so our job was to go after these and we were going after that dimension of five microns early on. So the first studies we did was with the, um, the first studies we did with the sharklet was comparing it against the smooth silicone surface here. And you can see the aggregation again, the individual spores, the aggregated spores. And then you can see here we had channels and those were five microns wide, five microns spacing, five microns deep. And you see the spores fit in beautiful. I always tell everybody to think of it as a nucleation and growth process you see in it in uh, materials processing. The sharklet is down here and it can pick out one clear spore. There's another one that's shadowed here, but that's basically what we used to find. And so when you look at the numbers, the smooth is about 750. The channel was about two and a half times that. And if we repeat that experiment again, we see the smooth reproduces again. The sharklet surface, which was the plus three microns tall, two microns wide feature and two micron spacing showed an 87% reduction in that particular experiment. So that's the first time anybody ever inhibited it. So we thought we had something interesting. No toxic chemicals, we're just using the silicone and we're imprinting the bio-inspired sharklet pattern on it. So we went on to test the effects of the aspect ratio. And on the left is more alva testing. On the right, you see is a balanus amphitrite, which was a barnacle cyprin. And the interesting thing to note here is that the features here are 20 versus these are two. And so it's a factor of 10 larger dimensions all the way across. But note this, the spore density decreases as the aspect ratio increases for the ova. Over here, we compared sharklet to channels. The channels did very well also, but the sharklet was by far the better. And the most interesting thing on this was we compared them on a single plot of settlement reduction versus the aspect ratio. And we see these two plots and that's the data I just gave you on the previous slide. And what it shows you is that the settlement reduction was directly proportional to the aspect ratio and totally independent of anything with the species. And the biologists took a very difficult, uh, dim view of this and a very difficult time understanding it. But I pushed it and I pushed it to the extent that we started looking at bacteria and we asked the question, we use assays for the alpha and it's only 45 minutes long. What happens if you go longer? And so what we saw was <clears throat> when you go longer, smooth silicone is this path and the sharklet path is here. And the interesting thing is there's two sets of data here. One ex set of experiments were done in the fall and the other set was done in the spring of the next year. And the other thing we did is we compared smooth against sharklet on separate slides and then we combined the patterns to see if there was an effect. And they were exactly the same. The most fascinating thing to us was this equation at the bottom, which was written for bacteria in 1989. These experiments were run in 2011. And all the Zeus for attachment kinetics profile matched that of um, E. coli. So we immediately recognized that it's not a biological issue as such. It is a, it is a fundamental rules of nature. And I've always been a believer in thermodynamics. So that's where we've gone. <clears throat> so the designs here are just designs that we use for standard testing to compare everything. So this is like the lotus leaf upper left corner. The channels are like the um, blue mollusk. The sharklet pattern here, and this was a design grading I came up with triangle pillar. It does very well, but not as good as the sharklet. This is sharklet positive and this is inverted. And they're shown here, the dimensions were all kept consistent for all of them so we could compare them. And what we did was we built a model we call the engineering roughness index. We started this model just by plotting all the biological data we had. And this is the form that it took. And to me, it looked like an Arrhenius equation in form. But we basically ratioed the roughness factor over the reduced area fraction that comes from Cassie Baxter. And we just were literally fitting empirical data. When we added more data, it didn't work well. So we decided we had to change the equation somewhat so this degrees of freedom 
we replace by the number of features and the number of distinct features in a pattern. <clears throat> they gave us a better fit, but then we went on and we started testing Cobetia marina, which is a non-motile bacterium, but it was used under flow conditions. And when we did this one, we saw that we had to add the Reynolds numbers. So we got a better fit with the Reynolds number, but you see it kind of collapses all the data in one area. And the next thing we did is we added another material. We went to a hydrogel. So we had a hydrophilic silicone, hydrophobic silicone, excuse me, and a very hydrophilic hydrogel. And when we did that, we had to add in the terms of surface energy ratio to make this work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we found out with all of this was that we had an equation, we had a reasonably good fit of all the data, good correlation coefficient, but we had way too many factors. We didn't really think that that really explained the system. So we went on and started going back to the biological question or thermodynamics. And the way we settled on was thermodynamics. We took it from a statistical thermodynamics approach. We just go in and, uh, and basically say our delta J Gibbs free energy change is proportional to the area as factors of the surface energy. And we were able to write this simply in terms of the energy of the bond and the energy of the interaction is equal to A times the surface tension. And we can use um, Boltzmann's distribution to write this equation in this way, where we're just going to ratio <clears throat> the number of spores on the topography versus the number of spores on the smooth surface. And by rearranging this in simple um, mathematics, we come up with this function of natural log, number of spores on the topography, number of spores on the surface. And we did this using a Beth lattice where we end up with number of binding sites on the smooth surface and the number of binding sites on the topography. It's subsequently equal to the change in the area on the uh, topography versus smooth as a function of the bonding. And when we did this, we ended up with this plot in the lower left. <clears throat> we published this in 2013 and it basically, we rearranged it slightly, bringing the G of T over G of S over here on this side of the equation. We end up with a correlation coefficient of 83.83. We end up with a slope of one, and I'm telling you all that before I talk about the data because this is 10 years of biological data that we've been collecting off the sharklet and all the surfaces I just showed you previously. And the fascinating thing is, out of all these organisms, we see that we end up with a good explanation of the inhibition. And the other thing we were never able to explain on the ERI equations was the enhancement. And this is the channel where we had the five micron by five micron, five microns deep where we said it was like a nucleation growth. So we're able to show that that fits very well with the rest of the data using this model. The next thing we did with that model is we did a mapping function. So we took all of our experimental slides. And we typically, one of these experimental data over here would have somewhere on the order of 100 images per replicate. And we did three replicates, so 300 images. And we would map all those images, and we ended up with showing where the bugs, the ulva, usually settled, and it's in here at the junctions. Compare that to our modeling and get to see a very good correlation. More recently, we went in, <clears throat> and I work with Dr. Professor Lay at uh, International University in Saigon. And using Monte Carlo simulations, we went in to see if there was an excluded volume effects that we were missing because we'd only analyze the single volume for the um, C model. So using her methods and analysis, and we plot this data out, the orange line is the trend line that the C model predicts. The other data points are all her combinations of nearest neighbors effects that you would expect to see with excluded volume. And so what we sh she was able to show is exit correlation between the C model and her Monte Carlo simulations. So we're very pleased with that at this point. The next thing that we're able to do, um, not sorry, I didn't do that, but this is another group recently in 2018, did a hydrodynamic modeling of the surface and with bugs on the surface. And I believe they use a Pseudomonas originosa, it might've been Staph aureus. Sorry, I apologize if I made a mistake on which bacteria it was. But they basically looked at it from different directions to see what the flow conditions would be. And they were most interested in calculating the shear. 
So they're able to show a good correlation again with our C model, but what's most important to me is this is a shear model. And as a shear model, what they're really able to show us is the bond strength between the organism and the substrate. And I argue that comes back to the thermodynamic model in that we're actually measuring the energy that develops between the organism and the surface. And that energy is, is the uh, barrier to the settlement process to begin with. So good correlation, and they've got some more data coming out on that this year. Um, in fact, I just reviewed a paper, an excellent paper on it. So I encourage you all to um, gather a look at that one too. So let's, um, I've gone through that rather quickly. Um, let's take a moment now and think about the different applications for Sharklet. So the Sharklet for a urinary catheter, um, we see that that's the first clinical application of the Sharklet surface. And the, importance of this is that there's 600,000 cases of catheter-associated urinary tract infections or CAUTIs in the U.S. every year. It's about $500,000 in extra hospital costs per year. So no further reimbursement by government. And we know that the migra organisms migrate primarily up the outside of the urinary catheter into the bladder, causing the infection. So what this preclinical trial did was evaluate 25 men silicone catheters and 25 men sharklet embossed silicone catheters. And the catheter is schematically illustrated here. When it was removed, it was cut here and it was cut here. So we had three sections. And then we did um, microscopic evaluation. And I just realized I saw that the uh, citation for this is not on there. I'll add it before I finish this off. Um, the area of the biofilm on the Silicone was somewhere about 18% eight, of it was covering um, almost nothing on the sharklet. And then when you looked at the middle part, it was only about eight or 10% on the smooth and again, negligent on the sharklet. The scales were changed here because we were trying to show the sharklet was measurable. Then when you go to the tip that was in the bladder, you're up to about 45% on the Foley smooth and the sharklet was down around 18% covered. So it was a statistically significant reduction of the bacterial formation on these catheters in the bladder. And the patients and clinicians all claim that they were much more comfortable with the sharklet uh, pattern on the urinary catheter. And they found that the uh, catheters were much easier to both insert and remove. So the other study we did was with dogs and it's another um, visual one. So this is a section that went in the bladder. So it's flipped from what I showed you before. This is the center section of the catheter. And um, this is the portion that was external. And so what you're seeing is the sharklet pattern has almost no biofilm. This is a healthy biofilm in the bladder on that dog. And the sharklet in this urethra section, midsection, has some following, but it's not anything substantial compared to the smooth one. And then when you consider the the part that was out external to the dog's urethra, you can see the sharklet was starting to get followed pretty good, but again, nowhere near what it was on the um, smooth one. So again, very positive results, and these were in at least 24 hours um, at the Colorado State University. So the next thing I want to talk about briefly is that we took some uh, telephone cases and had employees using these every day. We split the film in half, so this has a protective cover on half as smooth and half as sharklet. And what we do is we sample from this using a Rodak plate, and you transfer it and grow the um, cultures, the CFUs out. This left side is the smooth side, the right side is the sharklet side, so visually you can see the dramatic reduction in the uh, number of CFUs are colony forming units. In terms of numbers, this is on the order of two and a half, uh, 2.7, 2.8 um, log for bacterial density on the smooth, and it's down around less than about 1.8, so full log reduction or 91% reduction for the shark with that. And that was statistically significant with a p value 005 published in 2014. Um, this next one is, is one we've worked a lot on, and it's, I'm going to bring it up and spend just a second on it because we've put it into ASTM because we're dealing with the material, the process, or pattern, 
a device that doesn't kill bacteria, it only inhibits them. And every protocol that's out there currently is all directed toward kill. So what this was is we developed one where you pretest, these are three different test surfaces, silicone, urethane, and a, and a poly, um, polypropylene. You culture the bacteria, you transfer the bacteria using a filter paper to the substrate surfaces, you spread it out, you let it inoculate on that at room temperature, remove that paper, and then you air dry the inoculated surface, sample it once more, grow it, and then you count, count the um, CFUs. So I can tell you right now, that's the smooth one. As you can see, SM201. So that's the smooth one. Let's look at the data. The data for silicon films where we did a smooth control versus Sharklet Plus 3SK 2x2. Did three trials, multiple replicates in each trial. Significance determined by t-test p-values were less than 0.301. And this was an example of p originosa here, smooth versus Sharklet. Again, visually, you can see the difference. If we come over here and look at the reduction, the percent reduction 99 from 96.5 up to 99 for Staph aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosus, E. coli, C. albicans, B. atrophius, spores. So over the wide range of different organisms, uh, sizes, geometries, we see that the thermodynamic barrier to settlement is the non-wetting character of the shark group. Um, another one we developed based on what's going on right now across the world, we've been looking at it before for some other reasons, but we call this the bead inoculation protocol for viral transfer. So you basically coat beads, glass beads, with an inoculum, and then you shake them up, and you let them hit the silicone film on the top. And then as you transfer these, allow these to sit, you remove that film, and then you can uh, Rodak plate, uh, sample that plate, or rinse off the virus and then sample it again that way, depending on which protocol. But what you're looking to see is how much virus is transferred and then how much virus is retained. Re retained by the surface. So in this case, it's going to be smooth PDMSE. And then we're going to use two different sharklets. And we're doing this again, if you recall back to the C model, we should have a wide range of capabilities in terms of dimensions. But we wanted to determine if there was a significant effect on dimensions for the viral strains, as being the particles are submicron. So we did a plus 3K two by two, which is two microns wide, two microns spacing, and a five by three, which is five microns wide features three micron spacing. And this is four microns deep. Remember the aspect ratio is important. So if we look at this, the log recovered, we see that for the viruses and it's um, coronavirus is strain 229E, it is not COVID, uh, it's SARS-2, but it is at least a coronavirus that will give you some idea how it's gonna perform. And the range of that is 60, 48, 68% for the um, SK, plus three and the plus four SK samples. For the influenza, we're going from 65 to 69. The, there is no statistical difference between these sets of data and um, no significant difference here between them all. So we're getting a range of this on the order of uh, 64 up to 69% inhibition of viral transfer. And we think that's very important in terms of what we're seeing happening in the world today. So to summarize, the bioinspired sharklet patterns um, do reduce the alpha lens I've shown that many times. I presented you with the Hertz surface energy attachment model and supporting information. I hope you feel confident that it's a reasonable model. I've also introduced this new hydrodynamic shear model, which I think also supports it. And then finally, I pointed out that uh, we get a reduction of bacterial growth by 71 to 90% on cell phone screens, for example. Bacterial transfer on experiments of 96 to 99 percent. And then we also see a reduction of virus transfers of 64 to 69 percent. So in my acknowledgments, uh, Chris Jones is my uh, director of research at Sharklet and uh, uh, microbiologist and did most of the uh, experiments I showed in microbiology. Ryan Metatol has uh, uh, helped me extensively with a lot of the PowerPoints we're looking at. Joe Decker and Chelsea Magin and Jim Schumacher are all my former alumni. And most of the work I presented today was based as far as the um, marine fouling was theirs. And then Maureen and Jim Callow from Birmingham, they're now retired, but they were 
a very important part of our team all the way through the process. So with that, um, I thank you all for your attention and I hope you have a, a wonderful uh, conference. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Brennan. Uh, it was a very informative talk. Now uh, the moderator will uh, read out the questions. Yeah, um, there is questions in the chat box. Um, um, Professor Brennan, I, I should thank you. It was a very engrossing and interesting presentation. And uh, it, it seems your finance on, um, on the Sharklet, you have really worked very hard. Uh, it works, but we need to understand how it works. It's uh, what I say is it's kind of the sigh of Schrodinger equation. Uh, it simply works. Like, yeah, it's uh, you cannot have a logical incremental explanation. This is how Bionspread design things are actually. Um, so the picture you were confused. It was uh, seeming like a uh, what do you say? Yeah, uh, uh, rod shaped bacteria. Probably it is pseudomonas aeruginosa. Step aureus are ball shaped bacteria. So, yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> no, I, I personally work in uh, uh, developing anti uh, biofilm surfaces. Mm, so, uh, but your work is majorly based on patterning. I'm trying to introduce some uh, complexes, metal, organometallic complexes, which is very much biomimetic. And, yeah. Let's see. Yep. That's different level of bias, biomimicry. Yep. Now, no, um, yeah, uh, Dr. Debashi. Uh, yes. Uh, there are a few questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, Q&A part. Uh, yeah. yeah yes. please, please. So, I would like to ask uh, Brennan on behalf of them. Please. So, uh, the first question is uh, whether has the mechanism been studied for the antibacterial and antifungal activity over the shark-like surface? Wow, I went too fast. Yes. Um, uh, in fact, um, that was, uh, so the antibacterial behavior, it's not, it's, and I should clarify that right now at this point, because as um, we were just discussing previously, this is not a kill mechanism. It's inhibition. And it's an inhibition based on surface energetics. So it's not antibacterial in that sense. It's antibacterial in that it helps slow down significantly, reduce the, the attachment, colonization, and migration of bacteria. So we've studied, and I've just given you a few organisms, and I refer back to my microbiologist at Sharklet, Dr. Chris Jones as being the expert on microbiology. I'm the materials side of it, but we've studied extensively anti-fouling for antibacterial, and the fungal um, can it, uh, the Canada is Candida, Canada, depending on how you want exactly. to pronounce it. Yeah. Um, most call it Canada, but I say it both ways to try to get to everybody. Um, but the Canada is another one. And then um, we've done uh, platelets. We've done a whole host of cells to show it. And the thing that I will add to it that I didn't talk about today, but our wound healing, um, we've also been able to show that the sharklet pattern can be adjusted to enhance the attachment the same way we saw the all the spores attached to the five micron channels. Yeah. Sorry, it went yeah. too far. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. And one more uh, question from uh, uh, audience. Can this help us in designing some advanced filters on face mask in order to use it during this pandemic situation? Yes. Um, I believe it's, it's going to be a very important part. Um, We've got a number of organizations that are interested in doing that and moving in that direction. Yeah. Um, so Thank we you. have a we have a physicist in the panel. He want, wishes to ask a question. If I'm putting it right, uh, Dr. Ramesh, I have unmuted. You can shoot your own question. The Maxwell distribution applied for distribution among the scale. Uh, is it universal or a specific case? That was the question. If I have put it properly. The distribution, um, that, the distribution that we used on the model is, should be universal from all we've seen at this point. I will point out 
that in that model, we have three different materials. We, so we have two different hydrogel, we have a silicone, we have a hydrogel, we have a silicone that's modified with a hydrogel surface. We also have in that model um, four, four different organisms. We have the Alvalenza zoospore, which is five microns, and then we have a navicula, which is one, uh, 30 microns long, and a non-swimmer, non-motile. Then we have Cobetia marina bacteria, and then we have the cyprids for the barnacles. So out of that, we go from single cell organism to multicellular organism. We adjusted the size of the features for testing against the cyprids. So we tested both size, we tested size surface energetics on all of it. Uh, one last thing. We also tested the flow because the Gobetia marina, we did both um, uh, quiescent conditions and flow conditions to evaluate their settlement on the surface. Uh, Dr. So Devashish, I, Dr. Devashish I just have yeah. one. Uh, I have one question for Professor. Please, please, uh, Professor. Um, you know, your last slide talked about viral transfer reducing from uh, 64 to 69 percent. Uh, what kind of improvements can be uh, made uh, to uh, inhibit the transfer even further, uh, getting closer to 100 percent? So, so that's a good question, and one of the things that. Um, if you go back to the model, the model tells me I've only got to extend my um, uh, aspect <coughs> ratio to get it up to 100%. And we are evaluating some modified patterns to get there. This, this viral data is literally hot off the press. We just collected it last week, uh, the week before, and then we had a power outage. So we're doing more experiments now but I anticipate we'll be able to get better results on the film for that. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Um, so if there is no more questions. Uh, yeah. No um, more questions, yeah. Uh, no. I would request no. Chair to thank the speaker. Please. Yeah, You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Brennan. It was a very inspiring uh, talk you were given. We feel very honored to have you in this uh, virtual conference uh, on bio-inspired design and engineering. Uh, so we will move on to the next speaker. Uh, okay. Before uh, Professor Brennan goes, uh, uh, logs off, I'll, I would like to tell him that there is now uh, almost 100 participants. <laughs> <laughs> hey. so, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, they were really excited. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, well, surprising. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all. It was my pleasure and it was my honor to be able to join you. So I wish you all the very best on your on your conference. And I can so, see yes. somebody's got a beautiful day there. <laughs> uh, he is from California. He's putting him himself oh, on. <laughs> California has got light uh, still. Good for you. That's yeah. Right. Is Dr. Good Shudeep morning. Rao. He would be our next speaker in this session, sir. Please. Okay. Um, Thank you so, very much. Um, I think uh, Professor uh, Salim Ahmed would like to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, uh, Sudeep now, please. Okay. I will share the screen. Thank you. Bablu? It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sudeep Mudapalli Rao. Dr. Rao is Chief Scientist at Intrinsic Advanced Materials USA and responsible for R&D and product success. He's a co-inventor of patented Cyclo technology designed to eliminate microplastic pollution in the oceans and textile waste in landfills. Trained as chemical engineer, he has immense experience in varieties of fields like aerogel, thin film technology, waste treatment processes, biomimetic coatings of monuments, and heavy machineries. It's a pleasure having you here, uh, Dr. Rao. I now request you to go ahead with your uh, talk. Talk on biomimicry 
for the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to join you, and I thank you for uh, allowing me the chance to speak. Um, before I uh, begin, um, I just wanted to um, observe that the time right now is uh, morning on Sunday, June 28th, um, but it is uh, uh, Saturday, June 27th uh, for myself here. So I, I feel that I feel like I've moved forward in time. Um, and at the same time, I'm also having you join me uh, in uh, um, by pulling you back into my time. And uh, but there is a, a um, puzzle here. How can we be present in two times spaces? How can we be present in two spots at the same time? And I want our our conversation this morning to be more uh, reflective. And it's not that uh, we have, you have seen in the course of the last uh, two days, uh, some amazing talks and some amazing presentations. And I hope that uh, the journey that we are going to have in the next um, uh, short half an hour will actually be a presentation of not just what I'm presenting, but what nature and what life is presenting for us. So I uh, relinquish uh, my, uh, my role as a speaker. <laughs> and uh, I would like to invite uh, Harmony. I would like to invite non-communicable and non-definable, the undefinable uh, to, to uh, arrive in our midst. I'm using a, a small uh, Native American uh, small uh, musical instrument uh, to bring about some distortions in our in our time space mind continuum so i uh, i also have my daughter who is ready to make some noise uh, in the background and i just want to take that moment for a, a short brief uh, few seconds so um, if you may indulge me i would like uh, to invite my daughter sequoia and I will share why uh, we named her Sequoia. Uh, are you ready, sweetheart? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. All right, this is Sequoia. Are you still gonna talk? Go ahead. It's your, the, 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 your, now you have the chance to make some music. But are you gonna talk while I'm making music? No, I will not. Whatever. Okay. Mm. Thank you, sweetheart. Go ahead. I wanted to share um, music in the process because I think that too often when we think about design and engineering and technology, uh, we forget that there are these fantastic um, uh, energy sources for us to capitalize on and um, fantastic uh, modalities to actually learn from. And so I, I hope that uh, it took me when I heard her, it took me back decades to Shankara Varana. Many of you might remember Shankara Varana, a beautiful movie, a Telugu movie. Um, and when I say that, I am transported from here in California to where you are in Vellore. Vellore where my mother was operated twice um, at the Vellore Medical College and a beautiful institution. So you are here, all of you together, all those of you, all hundred of you and whoever else is coming and watching and observing wherever you are, that there are institutions that we have created institutions of integrity and longitude. So when we create something, what impact are we leaving behind? What legacy are we leaving behind? What kind of systems are we wrestling with? What kind of systems are having a knee on our neck? What kind of pollutants are present in our system? What kind of nutrients are present? So I hope that our conversation 
is actually about discovery, self-discovery, about pure introspection, about pure observation with nothing else. My daughter who's six years, she's, she's six and a half years old. My wife and I, we gave her the name Sequoia because we were inspired by this beautiful tree that lives for 3,500 years. So 1,500 years before this carpenter from Bethlehem walked around in the middle, mid, in, near Jerusalem and Bethlehem, this tree was already doing amazing things, sequestering carbon, extracting water through the deep capillaries from the ground. And here it goes 350 feet. There is no other tree that grows as tall as the coastal redwood where we are. And so this sequoia tree, which has the most amount of carbon that it, has, it sequesters, there's nothing else that has greater mass. And so what is it about this that is fantastic? So this tree, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, not satisfied with creating capillaries that create such high vacuum to go all, why do we have geomagnetism? Why do we have plants? You take a bamboo tree, you tip it over, it twists, kind of like my finger right here. It's almost like as if uh, when you take a flower pot and you tilt it to the side and the plant changes, it goes against gravity because the more it maximizes its distance away from the center of the earth, the more it creates the potential difference and the more the water evaporates from the leaf, the more it can extract nutrients from the roots. The sequoia tree said, ah, you know what? It's too painful for me. I'm seeing this beautiful California Pacific fog roll in. I'm just going to inhale this fog. And so, the sequoia and the coastal redwoods, they breathe not just from the roots, but also from, uh, from, from up above, from the canopy up above. And so that's one of the reasons why we were inspired about sequoia, about long-term investments, about long-term footprints. I, I shared with you that today is June 28th, 0, 2020. Why zero? We are really touched by this concept of nothingness that we meditated upon. We constantly surround ourselves, sit below a Bodhi tree, sit below, and we reflect and say, I want to purify myself. I want to take everything away. And I want to meditate on nothing. And then there is the zero. We introduce the zero. I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, whenever you write the year from now on, please introduce that zero. Remember Y2K? We had this uh, two digits that we had, 67, the computer programmers in the 60s and 70s, they only designed for two digits because it was efficient. It was great. But when 1999 rolled over, now from 1990 it became zero. So all the computer systems were changed. So there the vision was for two digits. And now we're adding one zero before so that when it becomes at the end of this millennium and, and future millennia, we at least have a time span of 10,000 years. So when we are tossing a pebble into the, air, into the ocean, we want to think about those ripples for 10,000 years at least because as um, uh, beautifully shared by uh, Prakash Dhawan and other um, wonderful researchers, there are fantastic lessons for us to be learned and amazing lessons that have evolved over the last few, four billion years, 3.8, four billion years when life evolved. And continuously it has been iterating, it has been morphing, it has been changing. All I want to do right now is repeat this Isaac Newton experiment. Will you join me? One second. Did you hear that? That was an apple that fell down from the tree. So we have, and that, that may have been an insight or may not have been an insight for gravity for Isaac Newton, but 
insights are there for us continuously. They are talking with us at every moment. It's almost like that um, the mythology that we have that there was somebody, Narasimha, somebody tore open something and reflected and opened every single thing, omnipresent, omnipresent God, reflected inside, looked inside. There is chemical engineering everywhere. And in everything we see, we see chemical engineering or we see biology and, and the processes of, in biology and we see biology everywhere. When we are able to see both, then we are in a timeless zone. Then we are in a, oh, now we stop everything because now we are observing and keeping ourselves awake, awake to all the lessons, the myriad lessons that nature and life is continuously teaching us. Whether it is my mother sitting in that courthouse in Vijayawada, and out there on that beautiful courthouse, there's a beautiful picture of Mahatma Gandhi and there's a beautiful garland. And in the bottom, it says, Satya Meva Jayate. And one old lady in her 60s and 70s has to go back and forth. And here I am in America thinking, how do I help my mother going back once in a while? And I realized I turned to a mockingbird. There is a beautiful book by Harper Lee called To Kill a Mockingbird. Some of you may have heard that. How did a mockingbird and how did Hollywood, how did Atticus Finch, it's a fictional character, that gave me inspiration. I took that DVD with me because it touched me here. An African-American, what we call as Negroes, what people call as niggers, what people call as blacks, and what they people call as Kali. Those people, that one gentleman was accused of rape and this man, white man, he tells his daughter, holds her and says, sweetheart, he explains the ethics. He explains with integrity. And in one simple, beautiful movie about how a white man argues and talks about what is the right thing to do and how it's unfair and how a person gets a fair trial. So in all those that inspired, Atticus Finch inspired me and said, if he, Atticus Finch can get uh, justice there, why doesn't my mother in India? Because I, then I, I took that DVD with me, ladies and gentlemen, to a courthouse. I took that mocking bird. It might have been biomimetic design for the environment. How is that connected, uh, Sudeep? Uh, you, how, what, is, what does this have to do with that? Because ladies and gentlemen, if there is cadmium, that is coming into our digestive system, or if there is mercury, or if there is some kind of microplastic in the ocean as form of textiles, or if there are one dump truck, one huge, a few elephants going into the landfills every second, every minute, there is one, a few elephants of plastic going into the oceans in the world. Every minute, walking, an elephant, a plastic elephant walking and every second into the landfills. So if this much mass is there, do we look at it dispassionately and say, oh, this is just a technological problem. This is an underutilization. This is a bad design problem. Or do we look for the aesthetics of it? Does it make aesthetic sense? Uh, even uh, you might remember um, this beautiful designer, Buckminster Fuller said, if you design something beautifully, and uh, uh, you might have heard of Buckminster Fullerines and this beautiful structures and, and these wonderful uh, vehicles and futuristic thinker. If you design something fantastic, biomimetic or not, and functionally it does great. Like let's say for example, Dr. Brennan designs this beautiful finlet. And at the end, let's say if Dr. Brennan says, you know, it doesn't feel good. I don't like it. Do you think that he will be able to articulate and market that? Will it make sense? Will it succeed? It will not because, as Buckminster said, if it doesn't have beauty at the end, scrap that thing, take down that design and start from scratch. And so, as uh, Mr. Prakash Dhawan also said, share these concepts. Beauty is essential. Our capacity to comprehend beauty comes from our ability to love. Beauty and love are almost like intermingled forces. 
And so we need as designers, as engineers, as technologists to be able to leverage these, these uh, uh, faculties to be able to look at things, not just from design, not just from, from uh, heat transfer, not just from mass transfer, from um, integrations and, and yields and slopes and microbes and DNA, but also from these important and very powerful forces that can give us insight. Now, I want to share with you, I want to close that story about, by the way, this is a story that you're, different stories you're hearing from California, from me, Papa Sequoia. Satyameva Jayate sounded to me and felt like to me, perceived by my mother. Imagine if our mothers perceived a Satyameva Jayate. I took that Atticus Finch DVD with me and embraced it and I held it and I saw the judge. I respect the judge but the judge was not allowing for justice to prevail. So I said, your honor, may I speak? And I said, your honor, in this beautiful courthouse, we are here after so many decades after independence, we are about to have a diamond jubilee, 75 years, India. And I see Asatya Meva Jayate prevailing here. And here is this woman with VMC installed heart valve, and she has to subject herself and I was able to speak, it created a ruckus and apparently the judge was transferred. But my mother, without paying a single naya paisa of bribe, was able to get justice where there was somebody who was sitting in her uh, property. So, so in some ways, principles matter, ethics matter. And so ethics, aesthetics, what else do we need? We need uh, the ability to, to observe and to transfer so we need attention. That was beautifully stated. We cannot be numb. We cannot be intoxicated. We cannot be an oppressive force. And oppression doesn't have to come from a lathi charged or baton charging police officer. It can come from, or, or a husband or a, or, a, or a wife or a dog or a father or son. It can also be from a technology. It can be from a lobbying agency. It can be well-meaning, good, environmental, progressive organizations where we close ourselves and we don't open ourselves to say, wait a minute, is there someone being hurt by this? Is nature something outside to be protected? Do I need to save nature? And do I need to save nature at the expense of hurt and harm and, and disappointment and pain? So all these are forces we want to wrestle, but I, I, I share with you that in order for us to do anything, there are some basic fundamental things. We make something, we want to make sure that we undo. Fortunately for myself, this small little uh, damaged finger, in the beginning I was embarrassed, but now it's an asset. When my daughter was small, she was holding on to it. And so there are small little deviations from one design and that deviations and that small little iterations are what is happening even now. Imagine from 2020 right now, let us move 3.8 billion years forward. Let's fast forward and see and present ourselves there and say, oh, 3.8 billion years from now, life and who we are, we are going to be so beautifully self-assembled. We're going to be so intelligent. We're going to be probably doing some silly things, but we would be, it would be a fantastic space. So I urge you, we go there, we vacuum ourselves from the present into that future, but always remembering that we got to go back at least 8 billion years back and say life sustained then. We need to promote life because life, not just for us, but everything. And so that's a fundamental premise that I, I, I'm so happy to share. I believe I will bring my mind to a close because I believe we are getting to the, am I right? I'm getting, I'm getting close to my time. Is that right, sir? Yes, sir. Another. I, want, I, I, want to, I want to offer the opportunity that when we have create microfiber pollution, whether it is through the Seclo textiles that I, I'm honored to be a co-inventor of, where we said, we do everything we can. We upstream, we do washing in the in manufacturers. 
we collected in the laundry machine, we collected in the wastewater treatment plant. And if that microfiber goes in the ocean, let us allow that microfiber to perform sati in the ocean and let the microbes digest it. So let us make that particular microfiber become vulnerable, naked to the environment, allow microbes to play a role and extract the nutrients. And so if we are leaving, but in order for me to do that, I want to make sure that we have a code of practice and ethics that we don't want to feed our daughter. We don't want to feed our gardens. We don't want to feed living systems, things that, aren't, that are not beneficial. So there are some guidelines we want to think about. The solution to pollution is not dilution. It is evolution. And we want to create Achilles heels, Achilles, the Greek Achilles. We want to create Achilles heels intentionally. So, so when we talk about designed obsolescence, we also want to design obsolescence in case we make mistakes. And so we want it to be the, our materials to be powerful for us, but powerless against nature. Perspire for us, but expire in nature. And I want to leave you with a few things. Landfills, we don't want to create pyramids for a few billion years for people, future anthropologists and archaeologists to say, what were those people doing from VIT designing something that, was, that has gone into this beautiful pyramid of landfill? We don't need to give them data. We have our coal, our oil, our fossil fuels. Those are our batteries forever. And Einstein shared that if they, we don't have sunlight for a few years, life is gone. So we need local. We need to be able to have intrinsic energy. And we need to be, if we can't have solar, we don't have wind, whatever. We need to be able to have multiple broad diversity. So ladies and gentlemen, let us be open for protecting the environment to do good design, to do biomimetic design for the environment. Let us understand the cast numbers. Let us understand the safety data sheets. Let us study the chemical engineering. Let us make sure flame retardants, antimicrobials, DWR, durable water repellent coatings, all these, are we making sure that they are married right? And so those are the few concepts that I wish to share with you. I wish to share with you that we are free, that uh, as Steve Jobs said, make a dent in the universe. We don't need to make a dent in the universe because even if we tried the universe, there's no dent because the universe is not a metallic hard object. It is soft and effusive and the universe is ethereal. And we are here for a transient moment, like that fish that was spitting out that water droplets to get that insect off the leaf. It didn't do one droplet, it did multiple so that the droplets would collapse and accelerate and amplify. So each one of us, ladies and gentlemen, we want to keep now our antennas open. I hope that the hair on the back of your neck and all your body is all your vesicles, every single cell in your system is energized. And I hope with that, Okay, so with that I end my talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Namaste to all the chancellors, vice chancellors. I did not share in the beginning, but all of you gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, a true dreamer is no doubt the one who can navigate blindfolded without any hands with leprosy. We don't need to be Albert Schweitzer or even uh, uh, this Princess Diana or Mother Teresa. We can be individuals and we can observe and pay attention and design good things. And I want to give a shout out to Nitin uh, Narayan and Shankar Narayan and son Nitin and Clay Motupalli, my nephew, who is a VIT uh, student uh, in his last year in electronics and communications. I love what you're doing. I want to be present. I am sorry I joined late, but I look forward to uh, VIT, Amaravati especially, because Vijawada, Akiviru, Vijawada, Andhra Pradesh is where we are. Uh, Telangandra, I call it. So I look forward to being engaged with you all. Uh, my um, at uh, Sudeep Rao Twitter and Rao Sudeep Skype, please uh, engage with me and let us uh, collaborate and uh, work together to create uh, beauty. Um, and as this wonderful uh, conductor from uh, New York said in uh, Pyongyang, uh, when he went to North Korea, when the jumbo just landed, all the musical instruments shook, we didn't have any diplomatic uh, relations. And uh, there was only one thing this man said, what are you here for? They asked. We are here to make music. That's it. So with that, I end my talk. Thank you. Namaste.
Thank you, Dr. Rao. It was a very, very engrossing talk. Um, a, a very dramatic too. Uh, a, a, it was philosophical and uh, you touched uh, people uh, at uh, various levels. Uh, people could travel back and forth in time and uh, could uh, you know, connect and uh, make some sense. Uh, thank you for sharing your views. Now I request uh, Dr. Jay Prakash uh, if there are questions uh, that can be shared which you can answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as of now, uh, I don't see any uh, questions uh, posted. There are no there are no bad questions, uh, uh, <laughs> because I do not present uh, slides and data. I urge you, if you don't have questions, please share. Uh, if not now, later on, on uh, on the VIT and on this BIDE 2020 conference. BIDE 2020, not Biden 2020. When I type BIDE 2020, Biden 2020 comes up on the Google. Uh, but share, please, what are the problems that you think we need to solve ASAP, the top 12, the dozen problems that we need to solve? And how do we, and, and so please at least share that. Please share what are the problems that you have, most compelling problems for you personally, individually. Uh, even if all 100 people uh, give their problems, we accept them and we will wrestle with them and we will collaborate to solve I think them. Professor so, Suresh has a question. Uh, Dr. Sudeep Rao. Uh, good, good morning, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes sir. Uh, yeah, your, uh, your talk was a fantastic one. A lot of energy and passion. And it was music, music to my ears. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you uh, give us one strategy uh, by which you make uh, the microplastic susceptible for the micro just one strategy sure thank you sir um i uh, i apologize that i did not go into further detail um i, I felt that uh, there's information on the website i see uh, c-i-c-l-o c-i-c-l-o textiles.com there's lots of information out there one example i will share is that of course, with textiles, with any clothes, you can do multiple things. You can make fabrics and textiles or products out of any materials. You have a big entire palette. One thing that we share is that we wanna create an insurance policy. If you choose cotton, it's a natural fiber and cotton microfibers in the, in the ocean and the water, it's the natural fibers that are the most in terms of number. But now we're getting more and more synthetic materials as we use more and more. So if we choose new materials, like materials that are created by microbes, those are interesting. If we create new materials that come from region, regenerative materials, those are also wonderful. They have attributes. And if we have uh, hemp, another, another uh, interesting uh, material, polyhydroxyalkanoates and uh, you know, all these wonderful new bioplastics, things that have come from nature, as long as they are also able to be breaking down. With Ciclo, what we are asking is, if you as a designer, if you as a customer, if you as a brand, and if you as an industry are choosing to use synthetic materials, please introduce some weaknesses in there. I love for some yield for some weaknesses. And we dose are synthetics with some slight uh, nucleating agents that when those microplastics find themselves in the ocean, those nucleating agents allow for the microbes to populate. Individual microbes might not be able to, do not and cannot. Uh, individual microbes are not a coordinated functional entity that have communication protocols and enzymatic pathways and also, um, critical mass, they don't have enough, but when they are together. So we nucleate these by through the weaknesses we create, environmental weaknesses we create in these fibers, we create larger and larger colonies to grow. And those colonies are love for the surrounding synthetic uh, materials to be sucked into that particular crater of activity. And, and that's how that particular nucleation zone propagates out and it it allows for that microfiber and that fragment 
to actually be incorporated and bioremediated by, by nature. So that's just one example um, I will share. And um, there are other interesting examples of, um, of biomimetic applications in the environment, but I just wanted to touch on that. And that's a CCLO patented technology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, it was good though. Um, I should uh, thank the speaker for this uh, philosophical talk and uh, uh, really it shook us up uh, with this music and um, the overall idea. Um, I should thank uh, our uh, um, chair, Professor Salim Ahmed and uh, our moderator, Dr. Uh, Jay Prakash to uh, to be available in this uh, odd hours for us um, so i should also thank all the participants um, who has uh, who has cared to join us in this odd hour and uh, really uh, your presence made the overall program a huge success and uh, this is the last session so um, i should thank all of my organizers co-organizers uh, for the conference um, I can have an announcement now that uh, we have finally come up with some winners in the post e poster session and we will be posting it in the website. Um, uh, so please, uh, uh, please uh, uh, track it, whatever uh, comes on the website. Maybe on Monday we'll be able to post anything. So, um, so thank you everybody. The participation certificates and uh, uh, the poster presentation certificates will also follow and it would be sent to you in the uh, via emails. So uh, I should thank everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here and making this uh, by 2020 a huge success. We look forward to have a by 2021. Um, yeah. So let's see, let's see how it goes. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you all. Professor Suresh, if you have to say, say anything, my co-convener, if he wants to say something. Uh, no, I know. Thank you. I think um, uh, the first time, I, honestly, I've been involved in a virtual international conference of this nature, of this magnitude. Uh, it's just that um, I like to, from my side, with the connected issue yesterday, uh, the word of thanks was truncated. I uh, just uh, wanted to um, join uh, Dr. Devashish and thank everyone uh, to, make the, to making this uh, meeting a grand success. Uh, specifically, uh, Center for Nanobiotechnology and Professor Jitain for the uh, Zoom connectivity support, without which this uh, mm -hmm. virtual conference would not have been possible. Thank you, Dr. Devaj. Yeah, from my side also, a, a huge thank to uh, CNBT, Director CNBT. He did not uh, hesitate for a second when we put on a request to have his uh, subscribed version. Professor Jitain, he, he was stuck to the screen for all the time. Uh, uh, with uninterruptedly and he was addressing uh, subtle problems whatever the speakers and participants are following so uh, it was uh, it wouldn't have been possible with this uh, with his huge dedication and effort um, should thank him and uh, thank you all uh, again have a nice time and we are uh, I would suggest Dr. Sudeep he can join a microplastic uh, uh, conference happening in the in the 30th of July, uh, 30th of June, um, hosted by I'm, the I'm Center. Prepared. I'm registered. Center, Thank you. Center for Nanomedical. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.